Good morning. Uh, my name is Ken Oletta. I write the Annals of Communications column for The New Yorker. Um, happy to welcome you all to the 2013 New Yorker Festival. Jill Abramson. Jill has been the editor of The New York Times for the last two years. Before that, starting in 2003, she was a managing editor of The New York Times. Before that, she was Washington bureau chief of The New York Times and a reporter in the New York Times Bureau. He wrote a very excellent book about Clarence Thomas with, with a New Yorker colleague of ours. Um, and before that, she was at the Wall Street Journal where she had risen to deputy bureau chief. Um, welcome, Jill Abramson. Thank you, Karen. So Jill, let me begin by asking, assuming that I were in a cave the last two years and had not read the New York Times. No home delivery? No home. <laughs> my, my cave didn't get it. Um, what, would, what are the big changes that you see that you've made at the Times? Well, the big changes uh, have to do mainly with the presentation of our news report on digital platforms, where I think we've had a fantastic experience uh, enriching our storytelling and narrative journalism powers with video, with motion graphics, uh, where literally as you're reading, if there's an anchor character in a piece, you can a little piece of video will pop up, and you can meet that character and listen to what they sound like, uh, get a feel for what they're like. And I think it, it, it's not an exaggeration to say that we're creating a, a new way of, of, of reading. If you were a pitcher and you gave up a home run pitch, you would relive that pitch and say, God, I wish I could get it back. What pitches do you wish you can get back? What mistakes have there been in your two years that you regret? Hmm. I mean, over. I have a hard time isolating it to the past two years because. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I would say, you know, the most serious, uh, you know, pitch, and again, the, the Times is a, a, a team, so it isn't, you know, me alone, but, you know, the most significant pitch that we threw that had, I think, serious consequences and which we spent a lot of time examining how we got it wrong was our coverage in the, you know, lead up to the Iraq war, which, uh, you know, I was Washington bureau chief uh, at, at the time of that. And, you know, I, I have spent a lot of time examining that as an example. And, you know, I suppose there have been others more recently, although none is coming immediately But stay with that one. Uh, what's, the, what's the headline lesson from what the Times got wrong in the lead up to the weapons of mass destruction? Well, I think the headline would be that it's really dangerous to become captive to your sources and that when an echo chamber develops, uh, pushing a certain line or interpretation of an event that it's critically important, especially for the New York Times, given the important role that it plays on big stories to maintain skepticism and to have your ear out for people who are actually expressing a contrary point of view and may have evidence to support that, to not get into a, a group think kind of mindset, that but, that was the headline there. So if in fact they, many of these officials who spent their career in intelligence live in a kind of a cocoon, as you worried they did, and they were not exposed to other public issues that, or the importance of public knowledge of some of these things, what do you say to them? What, what, give, imagine you're talking to Mr. Clapp or me what do you say to me? Well, you know, we had, a, 
you know, I'm, you know, a little bit constrained in saying exactly what was said, but, uh... These nice folks? You know, I, well, I mean, it will sound corny to you, perhaps, but I actually, you know, spoke to him a bit going back to the history of the Pentagon Papers and, you know, the fact that at the point that the New York Times published the Pentagon Papers, there were, you know, Obviously, the Nixon administration went all the way to the Supreme Court and other officials saying that if this material was published, there would be, you know, very, very grave harm to the national security. And yet, you know, some years after um, Erwin Griswold, who was a solicitor general at the time, he was the one who actually argued the Nixon administration's case that the Times should be enjoined from publishing, that even he in a public speech admitted later that there is absolutely nothing in the Pentagon Papers that actually did harm the national security uh, when they were published. And that, oh. and you know, carrying through to now that, uh, you know, that, you know, we had, I would say, an interesting conversation just about the publication of the Snowden material. So then. why is it, why is it, Jill, that, that um, the Obama administration, in fact, uh, James Goodell, who was the counsel to the Times, right, at the has Times written of the a Pentagon, very good book. And he's uh, written a book basically saying that the Obama administration is actually worse. worse. Yeah. Are they? Well, you know, it depends Worse than on, the Bush administration. Well, the way, you know, rather than argue about who's worse, it's just a fact that the Obama administration has initiated seven criminal leak investigations, which is more than double the number of these investigations in all of the previous administrations combined. So. Is it inevitable? that an editor, not just of the Times, but of any place, uh, is going to be perceived as not nice because you have to make tough, unpleasant decisions. No, but I think in my case, more attention would be paid to that issue than... Because I don't think anyone like really spent a whole um, lot of time. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, you know, clearly there have been other executive editors at the Times whose temperament or whatever has attracted attention. Hal Raines and, was a yeah. sweetheart. You can say that. <laughs> I'm remaining studiously uh, quiet. What about the horse race, the coverage, covering campaigns like a horse race? He's ahead of the quarter pole. No, just been passed at the half pole. Well, that, you know, again, that, that obviously the, the, the times during the election, we, you know, showcased Nate Silver's work, which is, I guess, the, you know, quintessential horse race kind of coverage. And I'm not saying that doesn't have a place, but. Uh, no, no, actually, Nate Silver, though, criticized coverage in the Times and elsewhere for being too much, being wrong about the horse race coverage and providing right, too much of, of it. Instead of being fo focused on the, the data and the fact that it was right. not really as close a race as everyone was saying it was. But why, why this preoccupation? But I mean the preoccupation with who's, who's going to win. But the um, Times is guilty of that as well, isn't hmm? it? The Times is guilty of that yeah, as well, isn't I mean, it? So why don't you end it? You're the boss. Um, be, you know, be, it's a, uh, I don't know. I'm beginning to feel, can I go home now? This is like, <laughs> like really, I got up at like 8.30 in the morning on a Saturday. I'm giving up my time to be here. This is like starting to feel a little bit like root canal. Uh, <laughs>